Hey there friends, Dave Politis, k Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. Thanks for being here. This is a missing person segment. Now, if some people wonder why I'm going to go to this next tangent, I will remind you, chitting, Missing 411, the UFO connection. In the last few uh, weeks, we've had a lot of UFOs flying around Canada and the United States. Most recently, the U.S. says they shot down a cylindrical device, something, maybe a balloon, uh, over the far northern reaches of Alaska. Then, about a day later, uh, a cylindrical object, another one, is seen over the Yukon Territory in Canada. And the Canadian Defense Minister she got on TV, I watched it, and she said that she can't say much more about it other than it was shot down by a U.S. Raptor airplane fighter, and she wouldn't say much more about it. Then about two hours later, it's revealed that over Haver, Montana, and that's just about in the middle of the state, not a lot around it, the airspace over Haver was shut down by the Department of Defense with no reason given. Oh, okay. So, in a matter of just a few days, we've shut down three things. A balloon that we allowed to cross all the way across our state that we knew was a balloon, and we knew it was probably from China. Apparently, they knew that the whole time. But then... The item way far north, by the Arctic Circle, they're not saying much about that. And then the item that they shot down in the Yukon, they're not saying much about that either. So, many years ago, they had something what's called the Disclosure Project, and you can watch it online, it's, it was videotaped, and they had a lot of people come on that were experts, some FAA experts, some Air Force personnel that stated a variety of things and supported it with documents that UFOs had hovered over uh, our nuclear silos here in Montana at Malmstrom Air Force Base. Yes, correct. And we did nothing about it, even though they were there. And these are all Air Force personnel that were manning those areas that talked about it. So another man that uh, was part of an FAA administration in Alaska. And a Japan Airlines flight was flying through Alaska. And they reported a giant UFO paced them across the sky. And they filed a report and they drew a sketch of what everybody in that cockpit saw. And much of the radar data was redacted until this man, who was one of the FAA administrators in Alaska, came forward at the Disclosure Project and said, hey, it was all true. Uh, this thing was huge, following the 747 from Japan, blah, 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 blah. Huh, wow. And the point of the Disclosure Project was to bring credible people forward to report on what was happening in our world back when it when it happened. And there were credible people. It was a good job by everybody who was involved. And then since then, everything kind of went quiet again. And it was as though the powers to be wanted you to think that this UFO thing, eh, not really happening. And then we disclosed in our movie that UFOs were seen over Warren Air Force Base in Wyoming. And that was made possible by the release of documents by a, mis a Mr. Hastings. And again, Air Force personnel came out and talked about it. There have been rumors for decades that disclosure on this topic may come in our lifetime, may not. 
and that our government may come out and admit it and may not. And we have all these little tidbits of information that come out from time to time. Like a person like me who has no affiliation and no financial support from anybody makes a movie just based on the facts of what I knew about a small area of Wyoming, Idaho, Montana, Washington, British Columbia, just talked about it in our movie. So what is really going on here? Well, thousands of people in our lifetime have claimed that they've been abducted by some type of entity that they couldn't associate with a human being. And I talked to you in classes, in the Bigfoot class, about Dr. John Mack and how he had talked to abductees. He was a Harvard physician and he found that their story was credible. But our government doesn't want to give that credibility stamp to anybody making these claims. And they just want to stay away. As in, they had something called Project Blue Book. And really, Project Blue Book was something by our government just designed to demean and dismiss uh, many of the UFO sightings. But as it happened, the people working in Project Blue Book found several sightings that even they couldn't dismiss as swamp gas and, uh, oh, that's Venus in the sky that's moving. <laughs> I mean, there's all kinds of things. But the point was, there's a lot of credible things out there that people have said. Um, there's a group of individuals that will demean me because I made this movie about the connection between UFOs and missing people. They won't watch the movie and they won't say, hey, Dave's taking this giant leap of logic that doesn't make sense. They won't say that because they don't even watch the movie. They just demean. And then they demean the people that claim that they were abducted. They claim that, as in my movie, the man that we interviewed at length about his abduction as a hunter didn't happen any time during the point I was doing research on missing people, this happened way back 50 years ago. He'd gotten so much ridicule during his life, he didn't care. He didn't care if anybody believed him. And let me say something. When I interviewed that gentleman in the movie, and he was a very nice man, he, his wife, his daughter, were the nicest of people. There was never any indication he was being evasive. I, I have read his story probably 30 times on different publications. It stayed exactly consistent. He had the scarring on his lungs from tuberculosis that wasn't there after he was abducted and the doctors couldn't explain it. I understand why people who have had unbelievable things happen to them don't want to talk about it but Carl was one of those guys that when he went and met me he could have turned me around and sent me home but he didn't and he gave his last interview ever and I take that as a huge responsibility because Carl's up there right now and all the questions he had about the world I hope they're answered and I hope that he looks down at me as the person who has temporary custody of his story that says hey that politest guy he's doing a respectable job because that's all I ask. Give it a chance, watch the movie, read the books, get an understanding of what's happening, 
don't believe all of the garbage on the periphery. What's that, Dave? I, I'm honest with you. Some of the garbage on the periphery? The, my Wikipedia page. It's 100% garbage. Read all of the, the one-star reviews on this movie on Amazon. It's like the people didn't watch it and it was just a hit job. But I don't care. Because I'm a lot like Carl. I'm proud of what I've done. I know what I did was factual. And I'm not trying to pull wool over anybody's eyes. I need you to make smart decisions. Be a critical thinker. And coming full circle with this UFO thing. I really don't know where our government is going to go in a year or so with this. I don't have a lot of confidence that something really odd happened. Remember, remember when the uh, the aliens came down at uh, Devil's Tower. Can you imagine if some aliens landed and, and they met, let's say our, our leader that we put up for them to meet was Kamala Harris? I'm just saying, folks. Can you imagine what they think of us? It's embarrassing. But I don't want to get into politics. I want to stay with missing people, but in a lot of ways, I hope that if there's aliens out there, that they don't come for a while. Because if we pick somebody who's a world leader, let's, let's hope it's nobody from our country right now. Just saying. Every once in a while, uh, in doing the research, I'll come across a really weird story. I came across one. This was in the November 21st issue 1883 of the Boston Globe. The title was A Mountain Terror. Mysterious fiend in sheepskins and goatskins. A murder of a woman and her child by an unknown fiend. West Virginia mountains scoured in search. For some time, citizens in the southern part of Ohio County, West Virginia, about 20 miles from Wheeling, have been trying to capture a strange man who occasionally made his appearance at isolated homesteads, generally in the absence of the head of the house and brandishing a large club, terrorized the women into giving him food. He always appeared dressed in skins and never was known to speak. Of large stature and ferocious aspect, he has been a terror to the community and several attempts have been made to capture him, but without success. It is supposed he lives in one of the numerous caves in the vicinity. Yesterday morning, he went to the house of George Powell. Soon after that gentleman had gone to his work, howling like a wild beast and frothing at the mouth, he attacked Mrs. Powell with his club, fracturing her skull and otherwise injuring her. He then picked up her only child, a boy, about five years of age, and ran into the woods, carrying a boy screaming in his arms. A neighbor passing the house shortly afterwards found Mrs. Powell in critical condition, but she was unable to tell him what had happened. The man started at once for the nearest town and organized a party to pursue the wild man and rescue child. They soon struck the trail. Following it for five miles came upon a, the body of the boy. His brains had been dashed out against a tree. Two of the party returned to Powell's with the dead child and the rest continued for the search for the man. But at last accounts, they had not succeeded in overtaking him. There are several theories as to who he is. Some thinks he is one of the murderers who escaped from the Moundsville Penitentiary many months ago. Others think he is a maniac. All know he is a dangerous character and must be captured or killed. just found it fascinating the way they described it at the beginning. The way he howls. I've never known anybody who got away from prison that howls like that. Just, just saying. I'm sure there must be some nutcases out there, but... I haven't seen them or heard of them. On to some letters. Just a note to say I watched Missing 411, the UFO conne connection, 
It's an excellent addition to your other films. Direction, pacing, cutting, cinematography, sound, interviews, and production are all top-notch. I've been involved in animating on movies, videos, commercials for 25 years, and I know the amount of work it takes to make these films. It's such a massive undertaking and extremely daunting process of time, but it's apparent to all to see that you care and hard work make it to the screen for this film as well as the previous 411s. Each film has offered a sincere voice for those who have gone missing and to those who have experienced something they didn't want, need, or ask for. So yes, Dave, it's true. You should be very proud of what you and your team have created. I want to say thank you for it, for all your content. And the acknowledgement to Angie and the end was pure class. And your note to Ben made me tear up. Truly sorry for that loss. Also really want to thank you for your Bigfoot series. I've enjoyed every one of them. I liked one of the greatest wildlife artists, in my opinion, who is now in his late 70s about Bigfoot. He spent his life in the bush, and though he has never seen one, he has heard them calling while in the wilds of northern Ontario. This guy knows animals inside and out, and experienced hearing one. It was no animal. Well, Dave, I've written you before, and you often take your precious time to write back. You really are aces, in my opinion. You live by the words, do something nice for someone today, and so I respect that. What a better world we would have if everyone did that. I've said it before, you are one gentleman, an individual I really hope to have a chat with one of these days. If you're Angie or ever in Toronto area, it'd be great to take you both to supper. Thanks again. A couple things. The guys that do animation and special effects. Whew. Whole breed apart. And as I've told many of you before, do not, do not, believe 90 to 95 percent of what you see in videos because I've been in those animation studios before and I've seen 14 year old kids do things that would absolutely absolutely challenge anyone who's watching to see if it's real or not that's how good they are that's a young kid uh, so yeah the animation special effects in this cost a small fortune. His explanation about the amount of platforms that are involved in a movie and moving pieces and different people that have to get involved is just beyond my comprehension when I first got into it. I'm, I'm still not an expert at it. I, without other people being involved, I, I couldn't have finished. So, enough about that, but thanks for the note. Hey, just watch your newest YouTube video. I can't believe people had negative comments about, this was back when uh, I interviewed, this person must have just watched the James Fay interview, Bobo's interview, Bobo from Finding Bigfoot. I love the interview. It was very interesting hearing you and James share information on each other's findings and work. I hope, I hope you keep doing interviews. As a scholar, I love to read and hear so many different accounts from experts in the field. FYI, FYI. I know you have been discussing portals a lot. Here's a legend from the Seneca tribe I've uncovered after my upcoming project. By the way, the Seneca tribe still has a reservation in the Allegheny National Forest. They have a legend of a woman goddess who fell from the whole sky. Does that sound like a portal? God bless. Could be, I guess. I mean, we've talked in the movie about being dropped from the sky. Watch the movie. Okay, Dave, keep the main thought here in the first paragraph as you asked. When I was turning 22 years old, I wanted to get away for my birthday and drove myself from El Paso, Texas and headed towards Carlsbad, New Mexico. 164 miles and I've been there many times with my family and friends. Once you get past El Paso city limits, there are a few desert ranches then many, many miles of open and empty desert land and mountains. It was about 10 p.m. and I was about an hour past El Paso I had not been around many, any buildings for about 45 minutes or so. Just before the incident, I kept having a, to slow down on the highway because animals were acting very erratic on the road. There was an owl, rabbits, a fox, all doing the same thing, pacing frantically back and forth on the road. I'd never seen anything like it. I came up over a small rise and I could see something brilliantly glowing in the distance a few miles away. I was not tired. I've never done drugs or alcohol. I had no idea what the bright light glowing could be, 
because I was about an hour or more from Carlsbad. I just kept driving towards it. There were no other cars in sight. The weather was cool and clear. As I got near to the left side of the highway, I saw what I can only describe as a very large, solid, glowing white cow. It was at least 50 feet tall. It was like a Brahma bull type animal with the long droopy ears. It did not move. It stood in the grass and sand a few feet off the highway. Its entire being was made of light. It towered over the cattle fence, maybe five feet tall. I was speechless and terrified. I had no cell back then, no camera, so I drove on by and continued on my way. Later, I made it to Carlsbad and I planned on sleeping in my car and going sightseeing the following day, but I was so shook by the experience that after a little restless pondering, I turned back towards home and got back home about 3 a.m. I brought up what I saw to my husband, who thought I had fallen asleep, imagined it, or seen an advertisement. So I did research on my own. The best I could find was a Hathor, the god of Egypt. In Hindu religion of India, there's a similar white cow god, Galmata. I was raised Christian here in the USA, so I have no knowledge of these de deities. It took so many, many years later, as I sat with my son, and I was thinking about strange things that had happened. And I recalled seeing that glowing cow deity. Suddenly I broke out in goosebumps all over my body. How had I not thought of it before? The place where I saw the glowing cow god, glowing cow god, that day, I turned 22 years old, was the same place that as a 15-year-old girl, I had been traveling with a group of other teens in a packed car going to Carlsbad. We lost control. The car went off the road to the left side, flipped over and over, throwing one of the kids out. So what does it all mean? I don't know. I was getting a hotel room two years ago and the Indian lady running the place had her Hindu god postcards on the counter. I told her I had seen her god. Maybe she believed me, maybe not. But please keep me in mind if you have other people who have seen the ancient deities or such. I'd love to talk about it or show you the approximate place. You ever revisit under similar circumstances, night driving, no one around? Let us see if Hathor returns. Could it have been a projected image? That's what I was thinking. Just to see maybe how you react. I don't know. Interesting story. Mr. Politis. My heart goes out to you, David. I've been watching and listening for four years now. I want you to know how much your work has done to me. You have held my hand through some very dark times, even though you didn't know it. I've dealt with depression and anxiety for years now, and you sharing your yours and Ben's story is so relatable. I appreciate your sheer honesty with this situation. I think you are, are helping a lot of people in yet another great way. Keep up the good work. I hope it gets a little better every day. Thank you, David. More than you'll ever know. Sincerely. Thank you. I'm glad I could help anybody. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just talking to you like a friend. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm just talking to you like a friend and hoping that we can all get along on this world. That we can all share our, our ups and downs with each other. Be people and treat each other with respect and dignity. It's lacking here on this YouTube platform with other people who post here. Lacking a lot. Next letter. Hey Dave, I'm so sorry what happened to you and your son. I can't imagine going through that and admire your perseverance. I know we have never met, but I'm starting to pray for you regularly. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think you're onto something about a link between depression and spiritual warfare. That what was in your son's head was not natural. I've been depressed twice in my life and both times have experienced an unusual incident. Without any warning, I had a thought come to mind of cutting my wrist. It was not my thought at all. It was pretty graphic. At the same time, I fell back in my chair, became nauseous, and my shoulders began convulsing. I was white and sweaty. All this was within a few seconds, and I had no idea what had just happened. In the months that followed, I became extremely depressed and suicidal. 
In 2017, I was again depressed. I could not read the Bible or pray anymore. The words just didn't come out of my mouth and I would get distracted immediately. One evening, I was washing up after dinner and happened to glance outside at my wife's car. In a split second, I saw some sort of creature sitting on it, looking back at me. It looked to be a tall brown skin and big yellow eyes that were looking right at me. It's hard to describe what I saw with my mind, not my eyes. I knew for certain that it had an agenda towards me. In both cases, I came out of the nosedive through prayer. I don't know how it works, but I would feel so much better afterwards. But when I didn't pray, the heaviness would return. I've heard that many times. Many times. Next letter. Hey, Dave. I hope this letter finds you in Huckwell. I'm an avid viewer of your channel and of your 411 films. You've done an excellent research on this topic and given the citizens of the world valuable information. This will undoubtedly lead them to ask themselves many questions out of the state of our reality. If that's happening, I'm blessed. I recently retired from DOD law enforcement. I first became aware of your work while listening to Coast to Coast AM while working the night shift. I've since watched all your films and many of your videos on your channel. I have to admit that after watching the 411 films, I was left with a deep sense of melancholy and felt perplexed and very sad for the poor families of those victims. Unfortunately, they'll never be able to have answers to what took their loved ones away and for what purpose. Whatever entities are behind this phenomena, there is obviously no sense of benevolence or compassion being displayed. To kidnap someone and take away from their family is in our society a serious crime. Of course, humans do this to one another some, somewhere every day and commit all sorts of horrendous acts. One can only conclude that these beings are not spiritually more advanced than us and have no regard for the pain as they cause. I would agree. After watching your latest film with my wife, we both said, I wish Dave had someone like blank with him to see that they could discern from some of these cases. As you may be aware, this person is a well-known psychic and appeared on many TV shows investigating paranormal cases for police and others. This may be the only method left to find out details of these cases. I know you have an open mind and hope you will think about it if you have not before. I mention this person because I believe she is a genuine psychic and could well be suited to assist in these cases. Her method is to go to the case blind so as not to predispose her of any impressions. As you are definitely dealing with something paranormal, it would serve to have a paranormal investigator conducted as well as other conventional means left with no answers. It may be possible that the psychic could not could make contact with one of the gone missings and see what happened. I believe I, I would try every possible means. I hope you take this in consideration. No disrespect to you who just wrote that letter. But I have been down this road so many times. So many times. Nobody has ever led to finding a body or a person. Nobody. Not an RVer, not a psychic, nobody. And you being a former law enforcement officer, then you know that this person that you want to refer me to doesn't need me. I have 1,500 cases in 11 books. You could go to that psychic give her the name and go find a body. Yeah, you two go find the body and I'll make you guys famous. I've said this a hundred times. Any psychic remote viewer out there, go find just one person and I'll make you famous. Do you know how many times that's happened in 12 years of doing this? None. That's right, none. Nobody's ever found anybody, period, that claims to be a psychic or a RVer. Oh, but wait a minute, Dave. No, no, nobody. And as far as in my world. So I don't care what anybody says. That's just the truth of what I've dealt with. Uh, the one RVer who said that they did find somebody who was recently missing, I called that person's wife and that person's wife said, that person is completely worthless. They did nothing. They took advantage of everything. They never did a thing. 
they were charlatans, blah, 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 on and on. Not one nice thing to say. So, for what it's worth. And what I mean, you don't need me, you don't need me. You, your, law, your former law enforcement, you have a copy of my book, pick out any case in the book. Blindly have the psychic go find the person. You're done. Okay. Hey Dave, my name is Nick. I'm from Southeastern Michigan. and I've been following you and your work for years now. I've gifted your Missing 411 books to friends and family for the holidays over the years and show support from the sidelines when I can. I also pray your videos at work with my friend JT and at home with my girlfriend Emily. I'm emailing you because I wanted to share two unexplainable experiences I've had. First one happened in Chesterfield, Michigan back in 2009. I was living in a highly populated area around 8 o'clock at night and was walking down the street with my headphones on listening to music. Big mistake. <laughs> There's only one place for headphones. In your room, in your house with the door closed. Don't wear headphones outside walking anywhere. As I was walking down, I get a sudden feeling that something was watching me. Then I was flooded with a sudden sense of, and a wave of fear. It stopped me in my tracks. I took both of my headphones out and started to be a fan because I wanted to look around. As I was scanning the surrounding area, I looked up. I noticed a very bright object just hovering there. I'd be lying if I could tell you the size or distance. If you look at a dime coin and held out in front of you, that's about how big it was. But it wasn't very bright. It didn't have any color to it, just white. After staring at it for about five seconds, this thing just shot off, leaving like a blurry trail behind it, almost like a shooting star. It all happened so fast, and needless to say, I just hightailed it out of there. My second experience happened in Lewiston, Michigan. I was listening to one of your interviews on Coast to Coast, and you mentioned a case, I believe in Ohio, with a woman in a tree stand, and she's seen a translucent moving object through the trees. No. That's in Missing 411, The Hunted. You can watch it on Amazon right now. I've heard you talk about this case many times, but today I heard it mentioned and my experience from my hips hit me like a ton of bricks. I was about nine years old and I was on my bed leaning against the wall reading a book while getting ready to go to sleep. All of a sudden I couldn't move. I was absolutely terrified because I didn't know what was going on. Now I know sleep paralysis. I could move my eyes across, but I could not move anything else in my body. As I was trying to scream and get my family's attention, I noticed what looked like two figures in my room. I could see right through them, like a morogue. Then I heard what sounded like clicking coming from the direction of the two figures. This detail didn't have any meaning until later in my life. As I was watching these figures, one of them sat down on the edge of my bed and the other stood there at the foot of my bed. Just like it happened, all happened, and boom, it suddenly left. The feeling that came over me when I was able to move again was one of the strangest ever. Almost like I was thrown back into my body, followed with a tingly rush, feeling of it all over me. Now this clicking that I've heard, I believe, it was them communicating to each other. Now, I did a little digging when I got older and learned that the Koshian, K-O-I-S-A-N language, Khoisan language, is arguably one of the first oldest languages to man. It happens to involve a lot of verbal clicking with the mouth. I don't know, maybe someone else can connect the dots. As you would say, I'm just giving you the facts. I appreciate what you do. I'm also a filmmaker, and let me tell you that your son Ben is an incredible filmmaker. The man knew what he was doing, and thank you for talking about mental health. You help me every time you mention it. Give Hawk a belly pat for me. Tell Angie I'm from Michigan. And if you're ever looking for B-roll boots on the ground or someone, just let me know. Thank you. For a minute, I thought he said, give, give Angie a rub on her tummy. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. I give, I give Huck more belly rubs than anybody gives their dog. It's ridiculous. Sometimes I'm walking through the house and she's laying on the ground in my path. And she'll just roll over on her back and go, okay, dad, come on. <laughs> she knows. Okay, my next one. Next one. In a past video, you suggested doing some homework on two of your favorite UFO researchers, John Keel and Jacques Vallée. The best. 
Well, while you were at the Sasquatch Outpost Conference, I did just that and quickly found out they both essentially came to the same conclusion with an additional caveat by Valet, and I'll get to that later. Keel states the following. Unfortunately, after all these years of research, study, and investigation by thousands of people and scores of scientists operating outside of the Air Force and government, there's still no evidence to back up the notion that flying saucers come from outer space. ka -ching. There is, on the other hand, considerable evidence that the UFOs are earthly manufactured and are piloted by normal human beings. Quoted from Keel's article, the UFO evidence everyone ignores, Saga Magazine, 1973. I tend to agree with this conclusion because there's so many cases that UFO knots look like ourselves. Dave, what if there's always been a clandestine group of people existing alongside us, yet years apart from us, far ahead of us technologically? Then there would be a hideout, one would ask simply within lakes, oceans, as you have indicated, and within the Earth, as we have indicated in Missing 411, the UFO connection. But there are different types of so-called aliens. What about them? Well, some entities could be clones or mutated experiments done on children and animals. Impossible, you say? Well, humans have carried out unspeakable atrocities. True. On the flip side of this, however, researcher Vallée has added an interesting caveat to the UFO phenomena. From his book, Dimensions, A Casebook of Alien Contact, Valet has the following viewpoint. The UFO phenomena represents evidence for other dimensions beyond space-time. ka -ching! From what I have read in, your, in the book, I believe Valet has found the smoking gun, so to speak, and UFO researchers should refocus their studies on this dimension. What am I even saying? According to Vallée, in multidimension physics, UFOs could come from Earth without necessarily being human inventions. So what or who would exactly live on the other side? Well, that's a million dollar question. We know that certain creatures have come through our dimensional plane, aka the past events at Skinwalker Ranch. Are there aliens in other dimensions? Vallée tackles that question and says, no, at least not in the conventional sense. So in conclusion, I believe they are dealing with two different realities. One, nuts and bolts. Flying saucers are of earthly manufacture and are piloted by normal human beings from a flash, clandestine group of people. And two, interdimensional beings exist within the spiritual or psychic realm and can flip back and forth from our plane of existence. With this context in mind, the beings and creatures are not your typical aliens we've been brainwashed to believe. Even Bigfoot could be an interdimensional being that can flip back and forth. You don't say. Really? It's so frustrating. I do all these classes on Bigfoot and people don't even watch it. Have both of these realities ever meshed together in Earth's past? It's possible. Take the UFO not Carl Higdon's case, for example. Was the male an interdimensional being or an operative for a clandestine group of people? This is where the lines get blurred and one cannot simply wrap the UFO subject up in a box. All I know is this. The future UFO invasion will be orchestrated by a scheme of man. Thanks, Dave. Well, thank you for that. It's an interesting way to wrap up the uh, the stories, <laughs> to say the least. So, we've got some very interesting missing people today. First case. Wake up, Canadians. First case is out of Ontario. Man's name is John Naismith. 70 years old. Went missing July 16th, 1943. He was a World War I veteran and he got he had disabilities from that that work in the war. He lived in a place called South River, Ontario, and he lived in that area his whole life. He was described by locals as being an extremely accomplished woodsman, hunter, fisherman. And he spent the majority of his life hiking, fishing, hunting those same woods by his house. Every morning, John would get up and take a hike through the woods and come back. Hour, hour and a half. On July 16th, left for the hike, same time, same ritual, same everything. And when he didn't come back, his wife waited and waited and waited. And by mid-afternoon, she called the RCMP. And that afternoon, people start showing up. Now, where is this place? 
Here's the map. This is Barrie, Ontario. And this is a little place called South River. And this is Algonquin Provincial Park. I've talked about this many, many times. This area up in here has many people that have gone missing. Many. Well, John was considered Mr. Reliable, Mr. Good Health. Uh, other than his disabilities, he was still considered a super good and experienced hunter, fisherman, outdoorsman. Well, the constable for that region at that time was one named Ball, and he was placed in charge of the search for John. Well, he called 50 soldiers from Fort Chippewa, and they responded. 50. He, they were told by John's relatives that when he took a hike, he always went into the woods. He never went near the river, which was also right near the house. So at the beginning, they always wanted to think that he went into the river and died, which wasn't true. And there was no evidence he ever went near the river. But there was a track that he took into the woods, and that's where they sent 50 soldiers. Then they ended up closing the schools in the area, and there weren't a lot. But they took all the students, and they coupled them with the soldiers, and they searched for five days. They never found one item of John's. They never found any indication where he went. In the words of the search and rescue, they were very frustrated. The family was disturbed. Uh, it was in July, it was warm. It had rained a few times during the search. River was near the house, but there wasn't a track. There was nothing they could find that was fresh that could indicate where John Naismith went. For a person that had disabilities, he was somebody who really just disappeared. There was multiple searches in the weeks and the months afterwards, never found. That's case number one. Case number two happened north of North Vancouver, British Columbia. Now for you people who live there, you should know this, that area starting at the coast and going east has tons of missing people. <laughs> it's so far ridiculous, it's beyond ridiculous. And this is happening so close to a major population base, it makes no sense. Now this case happened on a place called Hollyburn Mountain, just kind of south of Black Mountain. There's a ski resort up there. This is North Vancouver right here. Vancouver is just on the other side of the river. This is the Pacific Ocean out here. And this whole area going this direction from the coast, tons of missing people. Now the storyline to this is that the man's name was Robert Hopkins. He was 50 years old. He was working for a company called C.D. Schultz out of Vancouver. It was a surveying company. He'd worked for him for a long time. Described as very reliable, good in the woods, respectable. Well, they were, the Schultz company was doing work on a watershed area for Northern Vancouver and doing the survey on it. And people who don't know watersheds, they are areas that are restricted. Nobody can go into them. And that's really where a, a township, a big town, gets all of their water. So it has to be pristine. They don't want people walking through it, blah, blah, blah. Pretty wild. Very wild area. Lots of wildlife. So as, as the group was coming out of the mountains on this survey, John disappears. And at the time, Mr. Schultz thought, well, he'll, he'll, he'll show up down at the bottom. Well, he didn't. And 
Mr. Schultz got a hold of RCMP, got a hold of Vancouver police, and there was a small team put together for four days to look for Mr. Hopkins, a respectable employee. Temperatures at night were freezing, and there was issues with fog that inundated the search area that kept the RCMP helicopter on the ground and they couldn't look for him. There was a park ranger named Jack Wood who helped organize the search for uh, Mr. Hopkins. They never found anything. This wasn't a watershed. This was near a lake, near creeks, near rivers, and it's in a cluster zone of missing people. There were many times that searchers went back over the following two years and Robert Hopkins was never found, which never made sense to anybody. But that area starting at the coast, going east from the north side of North Vancouver, going inland for a good 20 miles, littered with missing people. Littered with missing people. Part of that missing people is what was chronicled in that movie right there. Man disappeared who lived in Vancouver, a hunter, and then disappeared while he was camping in a lake in that area. Trust me, folks, very strange area. Next case happened in 1905. John Karen, 20 years old, missing November 25th, 1905. These cases that I'm talking to you about today, nobody's ever heard of them. Nobody's ever talked about them. They've never been in any books. They've never been on anybody's site, although they will be now. This case never even made our Montana book because this is one we recently found. Uh, November 25th, 1905. He lived in a small town called Ronan, Montana. And he was from the Bitterroot Valley. He was described as one of the best known young men in Ronan. He was, they guessed he was in his mid twenties. Let me explain where this is. This is important. It's kind of my neck of the woods now. So this is Flathead Reservoir. This would be the Southern end. Over in this area, this is all the Flathead Native American Reservation. This is Ronan. This is the Mission Mountains. This is a road that if you're coming from Missoula and you're going up to the Flathead Lake, this is a road you'd take. And this view from the road of these mountains, epic, beautiful, gorgeous. I could go on and on. So that's Ronan. This is where the man was from. This is St. Ignatius. This is a, one of the larger towns as you drive uh, south from the lake. St. Ignatius, there's a gorgeous view of these mountains and right now there's tons of snow on them but uh yeah saint ignatius remember that talked about this that town before of saint ignatius because i've uh, chronicled a disappearance that was just outside of that town but karen karen caron c-a-r-r-o-n he was well known in ronan he and his family his dad, his mom moved here from the Bitterroot. Well, he decided on November 25th to go goat hunting up in those mountains. I can understand why the goat hunting would be good, but darn, is it rugged. They were hunting in an area 12 miles east of St. Ignatius. So to put it in perspective for you, this is St. Ignatius. So east would be out in this area. My guess is, is that he probably went through the pass right here, came around the backside and was hunting the backside because they said it was about 12 to 13 miles from the chapel in St. Ignatius to where he was hunting with some friends. And he was hunting with a group of friends. And during the day when the hunt was going on, friends said that somehow or another they got separated. How many times have you heard that? Literally. How many times have I written that in books? Well, he got separated, and his buddies met back at the car, or correct that, his buddies met back at their horses, and nobody thought John had a compass. 
He was dressed lightly, and near the end of that day it started to snow. Which is not unusual for November. It can be very cold up there in November. And other times it can be warm enough that you can play golf. It's weird. Both extremes. And in 1905 they didn't really have good predictors for weather, so John probably didn't know what was coming. He was described as probably the most well-liked young man in Ronan. Just so you know. The entire Flathead Reservation decided to pitch in and help and start looking for the man, along with uh, sheriffs and deputies and police and fire. They searched for five days, and the snow got so heavy and so bad that they had to quit. The next year, they went back, searched for him again after the snow left. The area up there in those mountains gets very steep, very quick. And when you're hunting for goats, you got to get up there. It's one of the toughest hunting of all because you have to get up in elevation. And you have to be in some dangerous areas. But still, his body should have been found. Uh, rough, big mountains, big weather, big game. There's also a lot now, I, I can't say for 1905, but now there's some uh, grizzly bear up there. Uh, so, oh, I'll give you a little sneak peek here. So right here, this is St. Ignatius, this is Ronan. In between these two spots, there's a, there's a, kind of a motel, hotel place here. You can stop in, you can talk to the people. It's run by the reservation. All of this is reservation land in here. Well, there's a reservoir back in there, gorgeous one. And you have to get a permit from the reservation to go back in there if you want to fish. Angie and I did it a couple years ago. And it, was, it was gorgeous. It was some of the worst fishing I've ever had in my life. But it was gorgeous going in and uh, didn't see anybody. Didn't see any wildlife, didn't hear anybody, but it was, it was gorgeous. And you will see, if you're on that highway and you're going towards uh, Flathead Lake, epically gorgeous. Don't make the drive at night, make it during the day if you're going from Missoula north. So, John was never found. There have been many people in that, just over the mountain, from St. Ignatius over the missions, there's a place called Seeley Lake. Other people have disappeared there. And it's that, what's the common denominator? They were all in that mission mountain area between St. Ignatius and Seeley Lake. But you can understand why, because when you look at those mountains, you see, okay, first of all, they're pretty much accessible. You can drive pretty close to the base of them. And uh, you can get up above tree line pretty quick if you're in decent shape. And they have a lot of, there's a lot of game known to be in the area. Uh, from, from Ronan up north to Kalispell, it's about an hour drive. And it's a, it's a four lane highway that goes up the west side of Flathead Lake. It's a gorgeous drive, really pretty, nice. Uh, takes you by, by a lot of gorgeous spots that you won't want to miss. So, that's my area, and that's John's disappearance. So I've given you three new cases that nobody's ever heard about. They're brand new, come out of our research bin. Um, if you could do me a favor, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, number one. Number two, post this on your social media sites. That would help. Number three, please watch our movie, please. It only costs you a couple bucks now on rental to watch it on Amazon, so everyone could watch it. If you're in another country, you can watch it on iTunes and Vimeo. And our other two movies, Missing 411's the first one, that's the one that Ben did as co-director, and Missing 411 The Hunted. Both those movies are out right now on Amazon as well, probably on uh, iTunes and uh, Vimeo too. But they also have really good ratings and they're stepping stone to understanding what is happening. Can you watch this movie first? Sure you can. 
I was asked the other day at a conference when I was signing books, Dave, why did you make that first movie? It was kind of boring and, well, I knew that there was a long-term path toward understanding this for me and for you. If I came out right at the beginning and said what I thought, I would have been wrong today. So I wanted to just lay down for you what we knew at the time and would capture people's attention, hold their interest, and definitely people would say, yeah, I don't believe that. I don't, I don't think a small child can walk nine miles in 12 hours over two mountain ranges. No, that's not gonna happen. Which is the reason why we highlighted young kids in that first Missing 411 movie. Showed extraordinary distances and unusual facts. That was step number one. It got your attention. People understood, hey, there's something weird going on here. Interviewed some people who had worked in government. Interviewed some sheriffs. And uh, it set the stage for what was to come. I really wasn't in that movie. My voice was, but the second one I was in, Missing 411, The Hunted. And that was putting our toe in the water and seeing seeing if it would work if I was in the movie. Some people would say, no, it doesn't work. Dave. You need to be out. Well, I get that. <laughs> Other people would say, yeah, we need more of you. <laughs> so try to find that fine line where we, we don't get people too mad because I'm in it. So that's kind of where we're at. And there's a lot more to understand about this phenomenon. If I had all the money in the world, what would I do? People asked me that the other day. If I had a couple of million dollars, I could travel around the world and really make a great movie. But travel is so expensive, it's ridiculous. Uh, the other day, we were uh, doing the budget on this movie right here and uh, getting the expenses together and talking about different things. And just the cost to rent a car compared to the first movie to today. When we travel, there's usually three or four of us in a car with all the film equipment. And the only thing that can hold all that up on top and in the car is a Suburban. A Suburban costs so much money to rent now. It's ridiculous. Somebody was saying the other day in Denver, it was like $380 a day. So if we're, we're filming for 10 days, that's, that's $3,000 or more in just car rental fees. That's really what kills you. And travel, when we have to fly four, five, six people around different locations, it's just so expensive. That's kind of where we're at. So make sure you're a subscriber, share it on your social media, and the most important thing beyond everything just be a good person. If you see somebody in distress, help them. Smile at people. Keep your head up. Keep your shoulders back. Hey, how you doing? Having a good day? Brighten up somebody's day. And remember, you didn't wake up today to be mediocre. You didn't wake up today to sit in your room and stare at videos. You woke up today to do something special because you are special. We're all individuals and we're all different. If you're depressed, you got to do it. It's exactly what you think it's going to make you feel better. I know it's going to, you're going to think, oh, just staying in my room, staying away from people that'll make me feel better. Exactly the opposite of what you should be doing. You should be getting out, forcing yourself to communicate with people, forcing yourself into the public. What do you mean by that? Go to the store and you see somebody in the, uh, uh, an employee in the produce section. Be real polite. Walk up to them, hey, you have any organic tomatoes? I was kind of looking for those. Force communication. Be nice. Be polite. Socialize. Honestly, this is what helps. Know that people care about you, because I do. 
and everybody, every one of these villagers out here care about you. And you just need to read the comments and the responses that other villagers put up. You're all good people. Thank you for being here. Thanks for being a member of the village. See you soon. Politis, out. <laughs>